Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. And welcome to this Azo Network webinar, which is titled Antibody Discovery Platforms to Support Functional Monoclonal Antibody Generation. This is Liam Sanyo, and I'll be your host for today's event. This webinar has been sponsored by Sino Biological, so a big thanks to them for helping to make this possible. Today, we are being joined by Dr. Jiahui Young, Director of R&D at Sino Biological, who will provide an overview of antibody discovery platforms and discuss how single B cell sorting can be used to generate functional monoclonal antibodies for a range of applications. And with that, I'm very pleased to welcome Dr. Jiahui Young. Dr. Young, thanks so much for joining us today, and the floor is yours whenever you're ready. Hello, everyone. Thanks for giving us this opportunity to present our work today. This is Jiahui Yang from Sino Biological R&D Department. Today, I will talk about our work in antibody discovery platforms to support functional monoclonal antibody generations. So today's talk will be divided into four major parts. First, we will briefly review the processes of antibody development. As immunization is the first step of the antibody development, we will talk about more about the challenges and the solutions of immunization. Then we will move to talk about the antibody discovery platforms. And for the last part, we will share our results and the data for some antibody discovery and experiments. As we all know, monoclonal antibodies is applied in many biological areas, including research and diagnosis, such as IHC, IF, flow cytometry, ELISA, and Western blood. So in addition, antibodies are also widely used in therapeutics. In this year, 2021, 100 antibodies has been approved for therapeutic use and there are still many more and under the preclinical and the clinical development. So first, let's briefly review the processes of antibody development. Antibody discovery is a complicated and long process, starting from immunization, antibody generation for screening positive cones, and then expression and purification of in vitro recombinant antibody expression, then followed by the functional analysis. So for example, immunization consists several steps, including antigen choices and which animals we want to use for immunization and how to per proceed the anti antibody immunization. For the antigen choices, it includes what types of antigens we want to use for immunization. If we want to use recombinant antigens, we need to figure out which expression host we want to use to express the antigens. And for the immunization, we can think about the immunization routes, timelines, and also if we want to use regular immunization or speedy immunization, which we will talk about later in the next few slides. We always believe applications determines the development strategy. So which means for some of the applications such as Western blot, IHC, those experiments are, do, are done under denaturing conditions. Therefore, the antibodies most likely recognize the linear epitope of the target. But for some other applications such as ELASA flow cytometries, and most likely the antibody recognizing the conformational or linear epitopes. So based on the final application, we need to decide which type of antigens we will use for the immunization. There are a couple choices here. For native proteins, it's definitely one of the good choice for antigens because it contains the native structures, but due to the low yield and it's difficult to obtain some of the native samples, it has limited use. This type of antigens can recognize both linear and conformational epitopes. 
So therefore, we will use recombinant proteins as antigens. It has high yield, but not always the same as native proteins for the structure part. There are also, we can use peptide for the linear epitope antibody generations. It can be synthesized in vitro, so you can easily obtain a large amount of antigens for immunizations. But peptides, is, have, it has low immune response. So usually you need to um, use a carrier protein to boost the immune response. We can also use DNA or cells and for this type of antigens, it can produce antibodies and recognizing both linear and conformational antigens because they contain the native or close native structures. But for DNA or cells, it also has a problem of low immune response. And sometimes for the cell surfaces, they have some complicated surface proteins which uh, have challenges for the screening part. So here is an example when we produce an uh, antibody targeting the specific epitopes. And this epitope is located within a high homology sequences. Uh, we want to produce an um, actin antibodies, which specifically recognize the smooth muscle actins. So when we search these genes in the genome, we find out there are a couple other genes shares high homology sequences with the smooth muscle actins. So we label the right amino acids here, showing that this is the only differences between these several actins. So therefore, we chose peptide as the immunogene for these antibody generations. Finally, we successfully obtain antibodies can only recognize the smooth muscle actin without any cross reactivities with other muscle actins. As I mentioned before, immunization consists of multiple steps crucial for successful de antibody development. So as the start of the whole processes, the strategies of choosing immunization procedures will determine the following steps. So we'll discuss more about this step. As I mentioned before, there are a couple antigen choices for the immunization steps, peptide, protein, DNA, and cells. For us, cytobiological, since we have already set up several recombinant techniques for recombinant protein expressions, so we will prefer to use recombinant protein as the antigen for antibody discovery. So as I mentioned, we have HEK293 cell and CHO cells for protein expression. We also have insect cells, E. coli, and yeast expression host to support recombinant protein expressions. But there are several challenges of recombinant protein expressions, which I listed here. For the recombinant expression, sometimes we'll get low expression level. We can see that this is a, a protein used E. coli system to express the recombinant protein. And before and after the induction, we hardly see the target protein present in the E. coli host. We also observe aggregates after protein expressions. And some of these aggregates are insoluble proteins, such as in incursion bodies when we use E. coli system for protein expression. Degradation is another problem we usually see during protein expression. We are seeing the target proteins located on this band, but we are also seeing some degradations after purification. For some of the enzymes as um, antigens, when we use recombinant expression technologies, from batch to batch, we are seeing the variations. So how are we gonna solve these problems? So here's a couple solutions to solve the recombinant antigen expression problems. So this is uh, one example. We did vector optimization. We optimized the expression vectors 
to try to increase the expression level of the recombinant proteins. And here is the example, the green light shows the GFP proteins. We can see that when we use our expression vectors, we are seeing more GFP proteins expressed in different types of cell lines. We also have different generations of plasmid. Um, we are seeing that for this Sinobiological plasmid level two, which have better expression yield compared with other two different uh, two plasmids. We usually optimize the culture conditions to improve protein yield or to solve the degradation and the aggregation problems. Here are four examples showing here. And this is the problem for the protein degradation. We can see that as long as the culture duration increase, we are seeing more degradations. Of course, we are also seeing more proteins expression after 30 hours incubations. But if we don't want to use the degraded antigens for immunization, we probably gonna stop the culture expression at 26 hours. And we can also change the temperature of the expression. If we are using relatively lower temperatures, we will see fewer degradations for the targeted proteins. This is example showing the insect vacuolar virus expression systems by optimizing the MOI. So this is the transfection ratio of the viruses and cells. And we are seeing for this experiments MOI3, this is not the MOI exam number, this is the experiment number three, we are seeing more proteins expressed in insect cells. To solve the aggregation problems, we can definitely use uh, adding additives to decrease the aggregates. So for two proteins, the process works for using these components. And with, with and without additives, we are seeing more proteins expressed in this expression condition. And uh, we can definitely use DNA immunizations as we mentioned in the previous couple slides. And particularly for some of the transmembrane proteins, it is very challenging to obtain the pure uh, purified protein from no matter is the natural sample or recombinant host. So sometimes we are thinking to use DNA immunizations, but the most challenging part of the DNA immunization is it always gets very low immune response. So how to solve the problems? The first part is we optimize the expression vectors because we are thinking if we can improve the expression level of the target protein inside of the cells or the animals, we are able to get better immune response. So these are six different types of expression vectors. And uh, after immunized with different uh, vectors individually, we test the serine titer targeting to the positive cells expressing the target molecule or the control cells. We are seeing that the vector number C showing the best serine titer for the DNA immunization. So in addition, we optimize the immunization procedures, including the immunization routes and also the timeline and how many times we inject the animals. And we figure out the plan five and plan six showing better tighter of the serine after immunization. So therefore, we test the CD34 monoclonal antibody discovery. CD34 is a single transmembrane proteins and we immunize the expression vector containing the mouse CD34 genes and then screening for positive clones. And we find that the antibody we obtained are able to specifically recognize the mouse CD34 cells. And then you can see the differences between the isotype control and the, and the positive antibodies. 
So for the immunization strategies, we can also consider the dosage, roots, and adjuvants. So for different types of different animals, we different species of the animals, we will use different dosage for injection time. And there are also multiple routes you can choose to boost the immune response. For the adjuvants, usually we use CFA. This is very common adjuvants to be used for the immunization. And for the timelines, for some of the projects, we want to speed up the whole processes of antibody discoveries. So for the regular immunization procedures, it usually takes about two to three months to obtain uh, immunized animals. So therefore we, by changing the dosage and the roots and also adjuvants, we are able to obtain similar immunization titer when we only immunize the animal within three to six weeks. So if you are seeing here, there are 12 different targets and we are using rapid and routine immunization procedures the green bar is for the rapid immunization method, and the gray bars represent the routine immunization procedures. We are seeing that for most of the targets, we are able to obtain similar or close um, serine titer compared to the routine immunizations. Very interesting one is for the molecular, the target number one, we are seeing better immunization response when we use rapid immunization method. Then let's move to the third part, the antibody discovery platforms. So this slide is just showing the timeline of the important events in therapeutic antibody generation, including the major antibody discovery platforms. So we are seeing that the both hybridoma and the phage display technologies has been used for antibody generation for therapeutic use. And for single B-cell antibody techniques, which is discovered in 1990s. We are still waiting for the antibodies for the therapeutic use, approved for the therapeutic use. So just briefly introduce the process of three different antibody discovery platforms. I mean, in cytobiological, we usually use immunized animals, immunized mouse and immunized rabbit. But for other labs, they can also use um, the blood samples or tissue samples from the donors, either immunized or just naive. And for the single B cell isolation, we will first use different types of app techniques to isolate single B cells. And most likely we are isolating the antigen specific single B cells. Then we can obtain the antibody sequences directly from the B cell cloning by RT-PCR followed by PCR. And then we can express the antibodies by recombinant techniques followed by functional analysis. For the library, the antibody library, for cytobiological, we usually use phage to display the antibody library for screening for the positive clones. By this method, we are also able to obtain the positive antibody sequences directly after the screening. For the traditional hybridoma technology, we fuse the B cells and the myeloma cells to get the hybridoma and then screen for the positive clones. Clones. This process takes much longer compared with the previous two techniques. So for the traditional hybridoma, just briefly go through the process. After the immunization, um, we'll be able to obtain the B cells from the spin. And then by cell fusion, we will screen for the positive clones, I mean the positive supernatant for two rounds of ELISA screening. Then we'll do the subcloning of positive ones and then screen for the positive one again. If we want to obtain purified antibodies, we can do clone expansion for in vitro cell culture productions. So based on the processes, there are multiple 
um, steps can be optimized to increase the successful rate of using hybridoma technologies. So the first one is we have we have been discussed previously. We can use rapid immunization procedures because the whole processes for hybridoma generation is a very long process processes compared with the other two technologies. So we can shorten the immunization procedures. So second, for some types of applications, we can do serene screening for positive applications and to help us to decide which animals will be used for the next step. And then to increase the cell fusion rate, usually the the cell fusion rate is very slow and it determines the successful rate for the later. Therefore, there's a lot we can do to increase the fusion efficiency. So we use electrofusion to increase the fusion efficiency. So here are five examples showing here. When we use electrofusion method, we are able to get more positive cones compared with the regular PEG fusion method. Then we will screen for the supernatant, which is by assays for the final applications. For example, if you want to use antibodies for cell-based assay, we'll definitely screen the supernatant for cell-based, which means you need to set up the uh, set up a high throughput method for the screening. So for us, we use in vitro cell culture for production instead of the assays for the, um, cell, the cloning expansions. And sometimes and the, we directly obtain, we will obtain the hybridoma antibody sequences for longer storage because hybridoma is not a very stable cell lines. It may lose the antibody after several rounds of cloning or the long time storage. So this is another way to help us to save these good antibody clones for future use. So for the antibody library, the phage display, M13 is the most widely used bacteriophages of E. coli and is also uh, used for antibody phage display. The M13 contains five major code proteins, which listed here. And the most uh, widely used for phage display is the protein, the P3. This one is used to fuse to, fuse to the SCFV, which is the antibody, uh, antibody fragments for displaying the antibody sequences. Because P3, uh, it has a relatively flexible structure and its ability, it has ability to display large protein without losing its functions. There are major four types of antibody libraries, native library, immune library, synthetic library, and also cyanosis antibody library. I will not go through very details for this part. So after generate this display antibody, it will go through several rounds of bio panning to screen for the positive clones. We usually just do three rounds of um, bio panning, but it's for if we didn't obtain enough positive clones, we probably will move to more rounds of bio panning, something like five rounds or four rounds. So by incubating the display library, the phage display library with the target molecules, either coated on the play surfaces or in solution. And then we wash by washing to remove unspecified binders, followed by elude the specific binders. And after these three rounds, we are able to obtain positive cones for future expression and validations. So here are a couple commonly used biopanning method and the immobilized uh, biopanning is mostly used in our lab, but we also do in solution biopannings to, in case some of the antigens, when they coded on the place, they will change some conformational structure, which not be able to expose enough epitopes for the further antibody screenings. 
but there are also other methods of biopanics which listed here. During the biopanics, uh, we sometimes we didn't able to, we are not able to obtain some good positive, con positive cones. So we are looking for some ways to solve this problem. So there's, here are four examples and solutions for biopanning processes. For some of the target proteins, um, we didn't get good concentrations or low amount of target proteins. For solve this problem, we'll definitely switch the coding temperature from four degrees to 37 degrees um, to help to get enough coded proteins. And we are seeing that we are able to get um, good screening results for the biopanning procedure. And sometimes uh, we, we didn't get the good part of the clone clones. It might be due to the epitope exposures. So what we do is we will use in solution biopanning to replace the regularly used immobilized biopanning method. If we didn't get good serine titer after immunization, we will consider to code more target proteins for the biopanning processes, or we will try to get a new library with a relatively larger size to increase the successful rate of the further screening steps. For antibodies targeting for small molecules or peptides, we will recommend to use plates with better binding capacities. So here is the comparison data that showing that when we use the regular plates, we didn't get any like good binding results, but when we switch to the plates with better binding capacities, we are able to get good OD450. So the last, uh, um, Technology we are using in-house is the single B-cell antibody um, technologies. Um, after we immunize the animals, we, are, we will isolate the single B-cells for antibody sequence cloning. So here is the uh, flow cytometry data showing that for different types of species, um, we will use different procedures or protocols to isolate the single B-cells because um, for mouse, uh, B cells, there are uh, available set of antibodies to be able to um, select for or sorting for the single B cells. So we are using CD19, IgG1 positive, and IgM negative to select for the B cells. And we will also use labeled antigens to select for the antigen specific B cells. So for the rabbit B cells, we are only using the SSB, FSC, and then select for the IgG positive B cells, then followed by the antigen selection as a sorting to obtain the antigen specific single cells. And then we will do the antigen gene amplification after two rounds of PCRs when we will clone the heavy chain and light chain sequences to the expression vector for the further ex recombinant expression procedures. So definitely you can use the other methods which are listed here for the single cell isolations. There are a lot of uh, references available to describe all types of single cell isolation techniques. Then we'll move to the last part of the presentation, we will we want to show some results uh, when we make our antibody products in-house and also the challenges we're facing and solutions we will use to solve the problem. And the first case is about a COVID-19 antibody development. I think I don't need to spend more time talking about what is COVID-19. So for this antibody development, uh, we believe speed is the most important part to quickly obtain functional antibodies or specific antibodies which can be used for COVID-19 research, diagnosis, or even therapeutic use. So first, based on the sequence homology between SARS-CoV and SARS-CoV-2, here is showing that for the major molecules like the spike, they are, sharing, they are sharing very high homology of sequences. 
Therefore, based on this characteristic, we rescreen the SARS antibodies or libraries for SARS-CoV-2 antibodies because we have a large selection of SARS antibodies and we also already construct the SARS um, antibody libraries. So therefore, we are able to obtain some SARS-CoV-2 antibodies, and this is showing that the antibodies are able to bind into the SARS-CoV-2 S1 protein and also the SRVD proteins. It can also recognize the ACE2 expression, HEK2 to the NE3 cells can infect these cells. And then here is the, the, the fluorescence showing that the, the virus is, is inside of the cells. And then we definitely want to produce some SARS-CoV-2 specific antibodies. Therefore, we have to start from the beginning. We have to first obtain these antigens and then immunize the animals and do the following steps. And the SARS-CoV-2 antigens, there are some challenging parts. For example, the spike protein is a complicated molecule. So we need to think about which expression host to be used to obtain these proteins. And the spike is highly glycosylated homotrimer. It can be cleaved by host protease, and it has open and closed conformations. So for the spike protein, we chose HEK293 cells, the insect cells, to express these particular proteins. And for the nucleic nucleocapsid proteins, the N proteins, we use E. coli system or the insect system for these particular antibodies. So we are showing here that the SARS-CoV-2 spike proteins, this is the S1 proteins, has the um, functional activity to bind to the ACE2, the, the receptor on the cells. And for the N proteins, we pay more attention about the and uh, the, the aggregates, we are seeing that this is about 330 kilodaltons. And after three rounds of freeze and flow cycles, they are still able to present it as an oligomer, a stable oligomer. For the speed of the antibody development, we use the single B cells as well as the technology platform to speed, speed up the procedures. And the whole process takes about 30 days after the immunizations. And this is for the spike antibody development. We are seeing that we are able to obtain couple clones which has neutralization functions about the spike antibodies. And for the COVID-19 antibody development, there's another um, problem for that is the specificity. Because as I mentioned before, there's a high homologies between the SARS-CoV-2 and uh, the, 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 the previous SARS. But there's a, also have other coronaviruses, which is list, the common coronaviruses listed here. They also share some um, sequence homologies. But when we want to develop the SARS-CoV-2 specific antibodies, this is the problems. And so what we do is we try to enlarge the antibody libraries. And second, we use multiple uh, platforms to support the antibody development in, in order to obtain enough antibody clones. So here is showing the anti-spike and anti-N antibodies. We successfully uh, obtained the antibodies only recognized the SARS-CoV-2 viruses. Even now the SARS, like the, the original SARS and the other five coronaviruses. And the same thing for the anti-N antibodies. As we also know that the SARS-CoV-2 has a relatively high mutation rate. This is because of lack of the mismatch repair mechanisms. So these mutations or the variants may affect biological functions. And most importantly, it causes concerns of prevention because the original uh, available antibodies may not be able to detect the, the, the newly observed variants or may not have the function to neutralize the uh, newly observed variants. 
So here is uh, the couple examples of the variants showing here, and the spike proteins and the N proteins are the two major molecules for the therapeutic use and the diagnosis. So to solve this problem, first what we do is we make a large collection of uh, variant antigens for to support our new antibody discoveries because we want to find uh, antibody which is able to recognize all types of variants. In addition, we do the animal immunization, we optimize of the procedures. We use conserved fragments and or we will immunize multiple antigens to try to obtain antibodies which covering or has the ability to recognize all types of variants. The same thing, we use multiple platform to, uh, to support or get more potential uh, antibody cones which also can recognize diverse epitopes. This is an example for anti-N uh, antibody development. These anti-N antibodies are able to, I mean, several anti-N antibodies are able to recognizing the variants in the ELASA assays. And for the anti-spike antibodies, we focus on the neutralization functional and it can able to, it, it is able to neutralize in different uh, variants of the spike. And the last uh, challenges for the COVID-19 antibody development is the scale up because this is gonna not have work a lot. Like for example, for the diagnosis area, they need a large amount of antibodies for, for producing the kits. So we did some process optimizations and get the stability assay showing that even after storing at 37 degrees, we are able to uh, obtain the same SEC purity as the original ones. And for the last two cases, we want to focus on the neutralization antibody generations. And uh, the first case is we are using the hybridoma uh, technology to support the neutralization antibody generations. Uh, we definitely immunize more animals. Usually we just immunize five mice and this time we immunize 10 animals. And, and then we are setting up a cell-based neutralization assay to screening for the cones. So after the immunization top two animals for cell fusions, we are able to get 44 top ELISA positive cones and the, to confirm with the full cytometry, we obtain eight uh, parental cones confirmed with this assay. We did two rounds of subcloning and finally we obtain six um, full cytometry positive subcones like for the antibody productions and then validated by the cell-based neutralization assays. And this is the TIGIT antibody discovery. The TIGIT is a crucial um, molecule for therapeutic antibody generations. This time we use the antigen-specific B cell sorting. We obtain the single B cells and directly do the cloning and for the antibody expression followed by the validations. Within 26 days, we obtain multiple cones or multiple antibody sequences, which showing a similar function as two positive controls. So just to summarize today's presentations and uh, for all three antibody generation platform, they both have their characteristics. For the hybridoma, this is the traditional method for antibody generations, and uh, it can produce native chain pairings and also full length antibodies. But we need to do a lot of work to increase the fusion efficiency of the cell fusion. And also the development time for hybridoma is much longer compared with the phage display and single B cells. For both phage display and single B cell, these two techniques didn't rely on immunizations. They can obtain a large uh, antibody diversities. Uh, but for phage plain, this is not full lens antibodies. Usually it's SCFV and FAB. And this heavy chain and uh, light chain are not native pairs. And for single B cells, 
And the problem for this is, is depending on the single cell sorting technologies. And also it's a big cost for doing the RT-PCR and the sequencing. So therefore, um, there are multiple antibody development platforms available for antibody generations, and it will help us to get uh, all types of antibodies. And it depends on which application you want to use. So we can choose, you can choose um, either of them for antibody generations. So the last part, just briefly um, introduce what Sinobiological is doing. As probably you already know from the previous slides, uh, we are a company producing reagents and we are also using our technology platforms to support CIO services. We have more than 6,000 proteins um, available and also more than 13,000 antibody available. All these um, products are developed using our in-house uh, recombinant expression system and antibody generation platforms. We are supporting CRO services from protein expression, antibody discovery, and we can also do biological assays and large scale productions. And thanks for your time. Uh, I would like to answer any questions. And uh, here's also the contact. If you have any further questions, you can contact our local uh, office and thanks. Fantastic. Well, thank you for the great presentation, Dr. Young. And with that, we'll move right on to the Q&A session. So let's get right into it. Uh, Dr. Young, has Sinobiological developed any antibodies using DNA immunization? And if so, how did you enhance the immune response? Thanks for the question. We have used uh, DNA as immunogen for antibody discovery in-house. Uh, several antibodies are doubled by DNA immunization, such as CD34, as shown in the presentation. The biggest challenging of DNA immunization is the immune response. So what we do is we, uh, we first we modify the expression factors to include a couple components to help to increase the immune response. So actually, uh, this will help to improve the expression of the target gene in the immunized animals. The expression DNA sequences have been codon optimized to also improve the internal expression. We usually, we will confirm the expression level by transfecting the expression vector, including the target gene DNA into HEK293 cells before animal injection. So we can briefly get some idea how good the expression of this target DNA. Uh, for the immunization procedure, such as root number of boosts or the duration times uh, should also be considered for optimization in your exper experiment setups. Excellent, thank you. Another attendee here asked, what is the size of the antibody phage display library at Sino Biological? I have constructed a library with a size of 10 to the nine, but I still could not get enough positive clones after screening. Could you provide any suggestions? Usually as long as the library size of 10 to the nine is achieved, we will move to the antibody screening steps. If you, we want to construct a much larger library, such as 10 to the 11th, we will perform a lot more rounds of transformations. Um, usually we'll be able to obtain several positive clones enough for our further validation. But if we only got a few positive clones from a regular size antibody library, we'll first confirm the quality of the library and also the quality of the antigens and the reagents used in the screening processes. But if everything is okay, we may try to use um, other biopanning methods or changing the experimental conditions. Uh, for example, switching from the solid surface biopanning to in-solution biopanning or uh, coating screening antigens at a different pH level, which may help to expose more other epitopes of the antigen and may improve the number of the positive clones. Usually we, we are able to obtain positive clones after three rounds of the screening, but 
a few positive cones are obtained after three rounds, we will try another one to two more rounds to get more cones. Okay, great answer. Uh, and this leads us to another question here. Can positive clone rates be improved by using antigen-specific B cells for cell fusion to obtain hybridomas? Uh, yes, some of the B cells will express antigen-specific antibodies, even though the, the press percentage is uh, relatively very low. We, we use flow cytometry to sort these B cells, followed by cell fusion to make antigen-specific hybridomas, but considering the fusion efficiency, we'll definitely switch to directly obtain antibody sequences from sorted B cells, which will also save uh, several weeks for the procedure. Perfect. Uh, thanks, Dr. Young. Um, yeah, here's a good question. Can you explain how to obtain positive clones with diversified sequences from phage display? First, um, we will construct a library with a size of 10 to the 8 to 10 to the 9. And if sequence diversity is crucial in your further experiments, we suggest you can include a test to determine sequence diversity of the library, such as the NGS. Uh, we don't usually include this step. Uh, second suggestion will say uh, we'll try to use diverse selection strategies, including different types of biopanning, um, types of screening reagents or conditions. For the screening conditions, for example, we can increase the antigen coding amount to help improve clones with uh, relatively lower binding affinities. All the above methods could help to improve uh, clone diversity which could be tried. Excellent. Uh, and in the interest of time, I think we'll just ask one last question here. Uh, Dr. Young, how do you improve flow cytometry procedures to obtain a high percentage of antigen-specific B cells? We always think antibody development as a whole process. So if we want to obtain a large number of antigen positive B cells for cloning, so first we have to confirm to have an immunized animal with a good titer for our case to start with. For flow cytometry, since multiple labeled antibody or antigen markers are used in this step, we need to perform a pilot test to determine the proper antibody or antigen concentrations for each experiment. Second, we'll make sure to use labeled antigens with the correct activity for flow cytometry sorting. This will ensure that your obtained antibodies targeting the correct structure of the native molecules. Sometimes a slower sort rate can also help to improve the efficiency. Thanks.